Hello, this is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault presented by Blinzall. If you're in the market for some high quality racing oil for your two stroke or four, make sure you go to blinzall.com and use our discount code VAULT20 to save 20% at checkout. Thank you for all the support. This is Hannah. This is Bailey. This is Butters. And I welcome to the No in the Quest Vault. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the Motocross Vault. My name is Tony Blazer and what this video is going to cover is a look back at one of the most influential machines of the 1990s, Kawasaki's all-new 1990 KX250. Now, Kawasaki through the 80s was had a bit of an up-and-down track record there. Primarily in the 125 class, they were very successful kind of midway through the decade. The 250s had never been the best bikes in the class, though. They'd had some issues on the bigger bikes uh, early on, especially like bikes like the KX420 and stuff were not well liked. But as the decade went on, they progressively got better. And by 1990, Kawasaki was ready to kind of blossom a little bit and come out with a machine that really shook the sport up. And that was this 1990 KX250. If you look at the Kawasaki's, they were never like the best looking bikes. Certainly the styling was typically very conservative. Maybe the performance was pretty good on some of them. The 88, 89 particularly were very good bikes in terms of their performance, but they had very stodgy styling. Uh, the body work was very, you know, fat and pudgy and just not very sleek, certainly. Certainly not the best looking bikes in the class by any means. But in 1990, they came out with this all new design with the perimeter frame. Had an amazing ad, that holy cow ad. I remember I had that thing on my, uh, you know, my bedroom wall. One of the coolest hats I've ever seen. I still love it now. It's hard to think uh, in the age where all the bikes have perimeter frames and al they're aluminum and all the high-tech stuff we have now, how different this 90, 1990 bike was when it came out. They had the perimeter frame, which was something you'd seen on like road racers and street bikes, but never really much on a motocross bike. This one kind of broke new ground there. The perimeter frame was very wide. It was um, you know, certainly larger because of the basic design of it. It was kind of thick through the middle. This first one was tall and wide, and the bike felt big. If you ever rode one of these things, it was a big feeling motorcycle. Uh, it was very stiff, had a lot less flex than you would have found in some of the other chassis at the time, and the styling was just so cool. I just love, I still love the looks of it now. I mean, if you look at my good buddy Jamie Connor, it actually has one of these, uh, and if you ride it, it's pretty fast, and it feels, I guess, the best way to describe it is large. It, you know, a new modern bike feels so much more compact in a lot of ways. And this one, uh, this 1990 feels like a big, long motorcycle, but um, it was fast. Excellent suspension this year. Good overall bike. And certainly, maybe, I don't know if it was so much a quantum leap forward in terms of performance over like the 89KX, but certainly in mind share and certainly in the uh, the perception people had of the Kawasaki's at the time, it was a huge, huge change. And uh, this, this video is going to cover that first iteration, the 1990 uh, design. Now, if you like this sort of thing, make sure you check out some of the other videos I've done. I've done many other Kawasaki videos, including history of KDX 1A75 and 200. Uh, also, look back at several Kawasaki models. I just did the 2003 KX250 recently. I just published a history of the Suzuki PE175. You want to check that out if you like Enduro stuff. I do have some Enduro stuff. So I try to cover. I have some ATV uh, reviews, motocross, and, of course, off-road, too. It basically, if you ride it in the dirt, I love it. I'll cover it and I'll get to more stuff in the future. If there's something you'd like to see me do and cover, drop me a line here in the comment section too and I'll, I'll add it to the list of things I'm working on. If you'd like to support what I do here at the Motocross Vault, I have some Motocross Vault merch available. I just came out with an all new design uh, with the, using a uh, Little Hustler truck. Um, I'm doing a couple of these ones. Uh, somebody had suggested maybe I do some designs with the bikes in the back of the truck. I have a lot of fun doing that. I did one here with a Toyota with a Mike Bell Yamaha in the back. And uh, this other one here has the uh, basically a 1971 Datsun truck with a 1973 uh, CR250 Elsinore in the back. Uh, and you can find this on my Teespring store, and the link will be in the description below. So without further ado, here's the story of the 1990 Kawasaki KX250. Today's Kawasaki is a motocross powerhouse. They build some of the best bikes on the track, feel one of the most successful teams, and own a massive wall of number one plates for their trouble. They are the very model of a modern motocross success. This, however, was not always the case. In the early days of Japan's involvement in motocross, Kawasaki was more of a bit player than a serious contender. Early 70s KX models were powerful, but ill-handling and poorly suspended. With lackluster support at the factory and little or no interest at the dealer level, the KXs of the 1970s were often an afterthought to the buying public. In spite of having high-profile riders like Jimmy Weinert, Brad Lackey, and Gary Simix riding green, the Kawasaki brand failed to make much of a dent in Yamaha and Suzuki's dominant position in the later part of the decade. 
In the early 80s, however, Kawasaki's fortunes began to change with their renewed commitment to the motocross market. No longer produced in very limited numbers, Kawasaki's motocrossers began to find their way to consumers looking to break out from the yellow mold. Ever improving products in the small bore classes and a focus on new technology began to win riders over to the green brand. First to market with items like disc brakes and linkage suspension systems, Kawasaki's early 80s offerings were quirky but often competitive. By the mid-80s, Kawasaki had established itself as the brand to ride in the Mini and 125 classes. The KX60, KX80, and KX125 all dominated their classes with powerful motors that easily outclassed their competition. In the 250 class, however, the KX had proven to be a bit of a harder sell. The green deuce and a halfs were often plenty fast, but the mediocre suspension and cranky handling that got overlooked in the smaller divisions was hard to turn a blind eye to on the more powerful 250 machines. Stubborn steering and harsh suspension could be ignored when your motor was twice as fast as the next guy, but when all the bikes were fast, these shortcomings became a real problem. Toward the latter part of the 80s, Kawasaki finally started to get their 250 machines sorted out, and by 1989, the KX250 was one of the most competitive machines in its class. It offered a powerful motor, workmanlike chassis, and the best forks in the business. Its layout was porky, and its build quality was suspect, but for hardcore racing, it was a very compelling package. While the Kawasaki's of the 80s were not always the best machines, no one could have accused them of fearing to go their own way. Both in terms of engineering and overall design, the KX's were always unique. In 1988, when the motocross world was going slimmer, lower, and leaner, Kawasaki went the complete opposite direction with a 250 that felt, ran, and weighed like a 500. Big swings in both styling and design were never a Kawasaki problem. In 1990, Kawasaki once again blazed its own way by taking its biggest swing yet and introducing the most radical motocross design in a decade. In the late 80s, chassis rigidity had become the new motocross buzzword as Supercross had drawn more and more of the manufacturer's focus. Massive frame tubes, box section pivot points, and inverted fork designs were all the result of this quest for less flex. In the street world, a similar search was underway as the universal Japanese motorcycles of the 70s morphed into the racer replicas of the 80s. There, the engineers found that frames could be made much stronger and more resistant to flex by connecting the steering head directly to the swing arm pivot through the use of two large frame spars. Referred to as a twin spar or perimeter design, this new type of frame quickly made its way to ultra high performance machines like Honda's VFR Interceptor and Suzuki's GSXR. In 1990, Kawasaki took the bold step of bringing this road race technology to the dirt with the introduction of the sport's first perimeter frame design for motocross. Crafted out of tough chromoly steel, Kawasaki's perimeter frame consisted of two large box section frame spars arranged in a parallel fashion, which ran from the steering stem to just below the attachment point of the swing arm. Connecting these two large spars were a cross brace in the middle and an additional brace at the base. Unlike most road race perimeter frames, which use the motor as a stressed member, the new Kawasaki motocross design employed a rather conventional single down tube which split into a double cradle at the bottom. As with the 89KX, the rear subframe was detachable and crafted out of lightweight aluminum. Where the two models really departed though was in the mounting of the shock, which was connected to the 1990 frame by two large aluminum hangers. This both saved weight and made servicing easier. Overall geometry of the new frame was significantly more aggressive than 1989, in a bid to improve the old bike's rather pedestrian turning manners. In addition to the all-new frame, the 1990 KX250 featured a completely restyled bodywork that left no doubt that this was a very different sort of Kawasaki motocrosser. In 1989, the KXs had been some of the most conservatively styled machines in the sport. Their bodywork, graphics, and color scheme were more IBM than MTV, and most people found them inoffensive and rather boring. For 1990, that conservative demeanor was completely shelved in favor of a new aesthetic that made the KX250 look like a transplant from the future. Its Buck Rogers bodywork and bold graphics screamed to anyone looking that this was a machine made for the dawn of a new decade. On the suspension front, the all-new KX featured a move that most people had expected the year before. In 1989, Kawasaki had originally intended the full-size Kawasaki models to come with Kiaba's all-new 41mm inverted forks. Inverted forks were all the rage in 1989, with Honda, Yamaha, and Suzuki all making the jump to the more rigid design. At the last minute, however, Kawasaki USA decided the forks were not quite ready for prime time and pulled them from production. While the rest of the world got the inverted forks on their 89KXs, machines bound for the US received a version of the 46mm conventional cartridge units used by Jeff Ward and Ron Lachine on their works bikes in 1988. In the end, this gamble actually paid off, 
with these conventional units outperforming all of the sexier but less refined forks found on the competition. For 1990, Kawasaki was finally ready to take the plunge by moving to the inverted forks on all of their full-size motocross machines. At the time, this move was done to improve the steering precision, fork action, and chassis feel by reducing flex and thus eliminating any potential binding of the forks under heavy loads. By moving the larger and stronger portion of the forks to the clamping area, they could be made both stiffer and less prone to be caught in deep ruts. While this change did reduce some of the natural compliance of the front end, it was deemed an acceptable trade-off for top-level motocross and supercross use. In order to mitigate some of this inherent stiffness, the KX's new inverted Kiaba forks were significantly smaller in diameter than both the 46mm conventional units employed in 1989 and the 45mm inverted Shawa forks found in the Honda CR250. For the KX, Kawasaki chose 41mm as the ideal size to provide improved strength without compromising ride comfort. In addition to being less susceptible to flex, the new forks were also lighter than the old conventional design. Overall travel was set at 12.2 inches, with 16 adjustments available for compression and rebound damping. In the rear, the 1990 KX employed an updated version of Kawasaki's Unitrack single shock suspension system. Because of the new frame, a redesigned set of linkages was required, but the new system maintained the same leverage ratio as was used in 1989. Connecting the linkage to the alloy top shock mount, was an all-new KYB damper, which featured 16 adjustments for compression or rebound damping. The swing arm was all-new as well, and featured an additional cross member for 1990 to further improve the rigidity of the KX's chassis. On the motor front, the 1990 KX250 was new, but not as radically different as the rest of the machine. In 1989, the KX had provided a strong and long power band that hooked up well, but was a bit too mellow for some. After the powerhouse Kawasaki had produced in 1988, this shift to a smoother nature for 89 left many riders wondering where the horsepower had gone. Slower riders did enjoy the 89's less abrupt hit, but throttle jockeys lamented the loss of the old machine's burly blast. For 1990, Kawasaki looked to bring back some of the 88 model's powerful mid-range by specking an all-new cylinder, head, and exhaust for the KX250. Internally, the new cylinder featured a massaging of the kip system, with both the exhaust and scavenging ports receiving new profiles for 1990. A new piston was also installed that featured an alumite coating to reduce friction and increase durability. The compression ratio, bore, stroke, and overall displacement remained unchanged, but a new twin generator ignition provided an improved spark, and a new airbox and air boot increased airflow to the motor. On the exhaust end, Kawasaki designed an all-new low-boy expansion chamber, that improved the scavenging and mass centralization of the machine. This was capped off with an all-new oval silencer, which was designed to improve exhaust flow while also lowering the sound output slightly for 1990. On the bottom end, the new KX featured revised cases that were slightly wider and a revised clutch cover, which was designed to improve flow to the clutch. The increase in case size was necessitated by the revised ignition and an all-new set of gears, which were wider for improved durability. The clutch was all new as well and adopted the floating design used in the KX500 for an improved engagement and better lever feel. On the track, all of these changes added up to a wholly different experience on the KX250. The new motor was an absolute rocket that came on softer than the 89 out of the hole, but exploded like a stick of dynamite in the middle. Past the mid-range explosion, the KX continued to pull into an eye-watering top-end hook. It was faster than an 89, but also far more difficult to control. On a well-groomed track, the KX motor was brutally effective, with all the power even a pro rider was likely to ever need. It barked out of turns and launched the green machine over any obstacle the pilot was bold enough to attempt. Where things got a bit sketchy, however, was when the track started to dry out. On slick hard pack, the KX was an absolute handful. Its soft low end and explosive mid-range hit made it very hard to get hooked up, and the bike liked to oversteer badly if the track conditions were less than ideal. Exacerbating this handling issue was the new frame, which gave the KX a tall and top-heavy feel. The wide frame spars, tall steering head, and abrupt power made the bike feel unwieldy compared to its 250 competition. The new chassis was much stiffer than before, but the ultra-rigid frame imparted tons of vibration and made the bike feel somewhat disjointed in the turns. The super-aggressive steering geometry allowed the front end to bite initially, but the rest of the chassis was not always on board with this change in direction. Several riders complained that the bike felt as if the front end wanted to turn and the back end wanted to keep going straight. At 225 pounds, the KX was only a few pounds heavier than its competition, but it felt a good 15 pounds heavier on the track. 
In the air, the KX was stable, but direction changes required a great deal more body English than was required in the feathery feeling Honda and Suzuki. On the suspension front, the KX was far less controversial. Everyone loved the plush action of the new KYB inverted forks, and some even commented that their performance eclipsed the universally praised 46mm conventional units used in 1989. They were excellent at absorbing the kind of small, sharp hits that pummeled the wrists of riders on the Hondas in 1990. The overall action was excellent, but some faster and heavier riders did find the stock springs and damping a bit light. For them, an increase in oil level and maybe a step up in spring rate were advisable. In the shock department, the KX was also well regarded with solid and predictable performance. The shock offered a firm feel that most riders appreciated and the bike could be counted on to not do anything crazy when you encountered obstacles at speed. Some riders mentioned a bit of harshness in the midstroke, and like the forks, really fast guys were likely to need a stiffer spring. But overall, the KX's suspension package was rated the second best available in 1990. On the detailing side, the KX continued to be a bit of a mixed bag. The new bodywork was beautiful and cutting edge, but the plastic continued to be more brittle than the competition. Over-tightening the gas cap was a sure recipe for a lap full of 93 octane, and nearly all the bolts and nuts were easily stripped. The brakes, while powerful, were somewhat grabby and constantly in need of bleeding. The new massive foot pegs were innovative and super comfortable, but the springs and mountings were both fragile and prone to failure. The Super Trick alloy shock hangers also liked to crack, and it was imperative to keep a close eye on them if you wanted to avoid a potentially painful failure. Overall, the 1990 KX250 was an incredibly bold step for Kawasaki. Its radical and revolutionary design broke new ground in chassis construction and pushed the envelope of motocross aesthetics. It proved incredibly popular in the showrooms and on the track. It may have been big, tall, and heavy, but it also looked like a million bucks and ran like a top fuel dragster. Its avant-garde design influenced styling for much of the next decade and paved the way for the twin spar alloy frames we see today. Wicked fast, cutting edge, dead sexy, and just a bit unrefined, the 1990 KX250 was the perfect machine to launch Team Green into the new decade. So there you have it. That's a look back at the 1990 KX250 a machine that signaled a very important change for Kawasaki in terms of their styling, uh, certainly the perception of the machines overall. These are much different, more bold designs, and it really kind of was the first machine that pointed the way towards kind of the, the crazy styling that would follow in the next couple of years. This was the first Kawasaki that had kind of like that splat graphic on it. The colors were a little more pastel, and within a couple of years, you'd have insane machines like the Suzuki RMs and stuff that were much more bold than this. But this kind of kicks that off, where I think the... The fact that this had so uh, such a positive reaction uh, it led some of the other manufacturers to go even crazier with their designs in terms of like magenta YZs and pink CRs and stuff. And this Kawasaki really was kicked off the 90s with a bang. Really cool design. Uh, again, I love it now. Even now, it still is a good-looking motorcycle and a very, very important model for Kawasaki in terms of their history. Now, one thing I do want to mention, I don't ever talk about it. If you like listening to this kind of stuff as opposed to watching the videos, I do have a podcast. Uh, if you search for on any of your podcast providers, that's Spotify, iTunes, whatever, you can find the Motocross Vault podcast, and you can find these uh, reviews in audio form. So if you like to just listen to them in the car when I go through the history of some of these bikes and stuff, I know some people uh, dig that. I just wanted to mention it. You can find this in audio form as well if you want to check it out. Uh, if you could like, subscribe, and share on social media as well, I would very much appreciate that. It helps grow the channel. Uh, leave a comment. That helps the algorithm and helps other people find the stuff I do. Uh, and all that support, I really, really appreciate. So until we meet again, this is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault. Keep the rubber side down. Peace.